organizers for having put a really nice uh, workshop. It's been a nice and diverse group. It's been a lot of fun. And thanks for the invitation to uh, come give a talk. Uh, so I'm going to be I'm a little bit of the oddball of the group. Uh, talking about QCD, so it's a little bit different than what has been done. But it, since it's such a diverse group, I think I, I like to f feel like I, I still fit in. Uh, so I want to talk about the attempts that we're doing uh, in trying to study uh, few body systems directly from Lattice QCD. And when I mean few, I really mean very few. Uh, mostly I'll be talking about two body physics, and then I'll give you a little glimpse of the challenges associated with studying three body physics. Um, so almost uh, exactly a year ago, uh, we organized a workshop here at the INT. Uh, this was Sora Davoudi, who's still a grad student here, uh, Tom Liu, who was a uh, researcher in Livermore, but is now in Ulich, and I uh, organized a workshop that was uh, trying to devise a path towards studying nuclear reactions directly from Lattice QCD, and now we're just finishing a review article and trying to in summarizing what we discuss and what we see as the outlook of the field. And so what I want to use is exactly use that as a motivation for this talk. Uh, and what I've done is that I've divi I divided my, this is my personal view and doesn't reflect the views of the rest of the organizers, but I divide, divided things into three different categories. One which is spectroscopy slash scattering, the other ones which is form factors, and the other one, the last one which is uh, fundamental symmetries. Uh, by spectroscopy, is spectroscopy slash scattering, I really mean anything that involves simply just QCD. So it could be two-body physics involving QCD uh, interactions, whether it's elastic or inelastic scattering. So for example, uh, K pi scattering, which could be elastic or inelastic, as well as uh, resonance decays, which is uh, medi mediated solely by the strong interaction. And then also bound states, such as the H Zibarian, which is hypo uh, hypothesized as a possible bound state, or also the three nu neutron force. In form factors, I just mean uh, anything involving a matrix element of an external current, which could be QED or uh, electroweak, or even uh, anything involving some exotic, uh, some, uh, something beyond the standard model. But here, these two examples solely involve QED. So this would be two examples of. Uh, meson photoproduction with an external current that emit that injects both energy and momentum. And then finally, fundamental symmetries really, we mean uh, things involving the weak interaction. So for example, uh, as we were discussing earlier this week, there would be a, uh, it would be of great interest to uh, disentangle the strong piece of the double beta decay uh, transition amplitude. And something that has been extensively studied for in um, the lattice is k to pi pi. Uh, all of these uh, are just examples of a wide category of uh, phenomena that you know, involve a great deal, that have overlap with a great deal of experiments. Uh, the one experiment that I'll showcase is the one of my home institution, which is uh, an experiment which is trying to study the, uh, um, ex uh, so it's called GLUEX in Jefferson Lab, and it's coming up uh, next year. And what it's attempting to study is, uh, as the name uh, suggests, is uh, gluonic excitations of the mesonic spectrum. So this, uh, this is a little picture of the experiment. What it is is uh, you have an electron be beam that emits a photon. It's a hard photon that uh, hits a proton target. So it's just a hydrogen, hydrogen target. Uh, and it goes uh, via meson photoproduction. You create a wide range of uh, mesons that are then detected. Uh, and what you're hoping is that you find exotic mesons that have the quantum numbers that suggest uh, that there are gluonic excitations in the spectrum. Uh, and so having uh, these experiments, so JLab has been really pushing the frontier and trying to connect these sorts of experiments with Lattice QCD directly. Uh, and since this is a universality workshop, uh, I don't know if we've, we've put this plot yet, but this is a famous FMF uh, plot. Uh, and what you have, so what this depicts is, you know, this is a, the two body scattering length. Here's the positive. Uh, so these are uh, attractive interactions, uh, repulsive interactions, and uh, here are scattering states, two body bound states interacting with a, uh, a spectator particle, and then three body bound states. And we know that nuclear physics is near unitarity, but these scattering lengths are a function of the pi mass. So uh, far into the future, we'll be able to perform calculations at the physical point and away from the physical point as we choose. You can imagine that we'll be able to disentangle uh, this spectrum 
as a function of the scattering length, which is really a function of the prime mass directly from lattice QCD, since quark masses are our inputs to the calculations. In this plot, okay. So I can tell you that the, the, the light, lightest masses at which uh, light nuclei have been calculated is in the order of 500 slash, between 400 and 500 MeV. Uh, I would say, I would argue that the, the that being said, the probably the most rigorous calculations have been done at even higher uh, pion masses. So we're still a little bit far away, but the technical issues are for the most part understood. It's just a matter of having enough computational power to dial it down. In the Masonic sector, we're, you know, we've been able to do simpler calculations at the physical point, and then by we, I mean the field, not personally. Uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, the more complicated calculations have to be done at, at really heavy pi masses. You have to understand systematics and then dial the pi mass down. So, so k to pi pi is putting down the physical quark masses. That's right. Yeah. So that's a good example where. You can do things at the physical, but nuclei, they're hard. Yeah. Is one of increasing function or increasing function of any type? Uh, so I would, so that, that's a good question. Uh, it depends, so which channel, what's that? Yeah, it depends on the channel. It depends on the channel, right? Um, so for example, the dineutron, is not a bound state of the physical point, but then it becomes uh, it becomes a bound state away from the physical point. So for heavy pi masses, there is a dineutron bound state. So it becomes an attractive. So. Can you go through the previous slides just quickly? So how well are these ba uh, boundaries known from? For yeah. This one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, between sort of this this uh, pairing plus one versus FML physics. For nuclear physics. Yeah. This is just a cartoon. We haven't, I mean, I don't think that there's any, I have no idea if we even know what these boundaries look like. As a, I mean, if you dial the, the, the pi mass, I mean, uh, the only way to do it is lattice QC, right? Uh, I mean, you can use some, you can use Chi-PT uh, uh, very close to the physical point, but your error bar is just. I didn't know if there was estimates based on sort of corrections to unitary, things like that. Mm. I don't know how much is known about this picture at all. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, uh, maybe some, some other people. I would be, you know, I would say we probably know zero, but that, you know, very close to zero. But that would, I, I'm sure some people would have a stronger opinion than that. Do you have every model you have, you need both the neutrons and protons? Because with the neutrons, you have spin up, spin down. There's just two moments when we get to the largest getting in. Mm -hmm. no, uh, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, you might. There's no three body interaction for three identities. If you think of just S wave, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah, you're, you're, that is true. Okay. All right, so I've mentioned lattice QCD. I'm not going to talk about in great detail what it involves, but the idea is quite simple. You grab the QCD Lagrangian, you discretize it. The inputs into the Lagrangian are solely the masses of the quarks and the coupling, uh, the coupling between the gluons and the quarks. You put it into a computer, you run your calculation, and now it should come out hadronic physics. I'll give you a little more substance into that. Uh, so what we actually have to do is that you need to discretize your spacetime. You introduce some lattice spacing A, which is a separation between all spacetime points. You need to introduce some um, you need to furthermore truncate your, your, your volume because of finite computational memory. So L here denotes the spatial extent of the lattice, and T denotes the temporal extent of the lattice. Uh, as in order to be able to perform Monte Carlo uh, simulations, we need to uh, wick rotate our spacetime into a Euclidean one. If we have a finite volume, we need to define a set of boundary conditions. Typically, we, s we use uh, Typically, uh, periodic boundary conditions are used, but you can use anti-periodic in the spatial stand as well, or twisted boundary conditions in general, or Dirichlet even. Um, and I'll be considering anything that is periodic or twisted. Uh, and of course, you're doing in four dimensions. This is just a two-dimensional analog. 
Um, and then the pathway towards physics is you perform a calculation uh, in a finite Euclidean discretized spacetime. You extract some quantity, say a hadronic spectrum or matrix element of some external current. These, the, what you extract is a quantity that depends on the lattice spacing, the volume, the temporal extent, and then the quark masses that you input. You need to then, since this is performing a Euclidean spacetime, you have to develop some formalism that gives you some understanding on how that's related to physics in uh, continuous, you, continuous Minkowski uh, infinitely large volume. And uh, by developing this formalism, then you can appropriately take the limits of your calculation by performing calculations at different lattice spacings, different volumes, different quark masses if, if the they're not physical. And then you extrapolate and you get some physics out. And what I'm really interested in is in the development of this formalism to be able to guide lattice ca calculations uh, to um, tell them exactly what kind of quantities are, need to be extracted, how can they can be extracted, and so on. So here's the building block of any calculation, which is the correlation function. The correlation function here, I'm just, uh, there's a two-point correlation function, which I'm just simply denoting as a, the expectation value of some creation operator at some time, time y0, and then uh, some annihilation operator at some later time x0. They better have the same momenta because momentum is cons conserved. Uh, but in general, they could be different operators. They just need to have the same quantum numbers. Uh, by inserting a complete set of states in the middle, you get this identity that basically this operator, you can write as expectation value of these operators sandwiched with some eigenstate of the finite volume Euclidean uh, Hamiltonian, so the finite volume uh, Hamiltonian, uh, and then um, you get out the spectrum from here. So that is. Uh, from this identity, we know that we can extract the spectrum, and this is actually one of the uh, main tools used in calculations. Uh, but really, this, I could have also written this using a path integral uh, representation of this correlation function. And here you see the Euclidean spacetime action coming in, and that's why we had to wick rotate. If I would have had a, uh, perform, uh, would have enforced, a, would have done a calculation, for example, in a Minkowski spa uh, spacetime, then this would have been e to the i. Yeah, you clean uh, Minkowski action, and then I wouldn't have a definite positive uh, probability density to then be able to use Monte Carlo uh, techniques to evaluate this path integral. In general, uh, if you have a system, let's say I'm just thinking about an infinite volume, any state can be identified by a set of quantum numbers, say j, mj, so the total angular momentum, the simulator component, uh, parity, the uh, orbital angular momentum spin, and then some other quantum number, say, you know, some other quantity, of, say that I count the number of particles or I can identify some, some uh, index associated with flavor space. In general, if I have some incoming state, QCD requires that the, the outgoing states have the same J, MJ parity, but the LS could vary, and also this other arbitrary number B could also vary. Um, if I then put this in a box, uh, J and MJ, because uh, for example, if I put things in a qubit box, I no longer have full rotational symmetry, so uh, orbital and um, total angular momentum should not be conserved, and furthermore, parity in general is not conserved. So, so in principle, if you put things in a box, as I've written these states, everything could vary. Um, but things get simple, quite a bit simpler if you think about some simple examples. So for example, if I put a a, simple, a, a single particle inside of a box uh, and impose periodic boundary conditions and I have mirror images in every possible direction. I calculate the correlation function and I look at the ground state and I get some finite volume energy coming out. And it is, um, you can, if the volume is large compared to the range of the interactions between these two particles, which in the nuclear sector is dictated by the exchange of pion masses, this mass is approximately equal to its infinite volume uh, mass up to subleading corrections. And you can, what you in practice should do is just perform calculations at multiple volumes, dial that, and, and look at the volume effects and extrapolate to infinite volume. If you have a bound state, uh, things get complicated because you have uh, two different sets of scales. So if I have a set of mirror images in all possible directions, which I didn't draw, just uh, for simplicity, 
there are two scales. One is the interaction between the bounce aid and the mirror images, which is again dictated by the long tail, the, the nuclear force. And then also you have the, the size of this object compared to the volume. And so what you find is that the, as, the asymptotic behavior, the correlation function, is again a, is a finite volume energy for the system, which is approximately equal to its infinite volume. But the larger finite volume effects are dictated by the, the size of the system. And I will show how you can show this at least. Uh, I will discuss how you show this in the two-body sector at least. In general, things get much more complicated. And you, what you need to do is construct states that have good quantum numbers with the symmetry of your system. So if you have a cubic box, uh, then what you have is a cubic symmetry. If you have a spin, half integer spin, then you have to think about a double cover of the octahedral group, and so on. Things get complicated, but we know in principle how to do this. All right, so this is a little taste of what some of the uh, uh, state. When you say you have to construct these states as with symmetry, do you mean um, basically your initial states that you put in to the Monte Carlo calculation have to reflect that symmetry? The operators have to, yeah, these operators have to reflect that symmetry. Okay. Because these states, so let's say that I didn't, let's say that I had some. Um, let's say that I construct an operator that has a, um, that is a spin one particle and has no orbital angular momentum. Then this would be a linear combination of, and that might not be a good example, but but the the the, uh, the cubic, so the cubic irrep that has overlap with that is the T1, and in that case it's a faithful representation. So the T1 has uh, is a one to one representation. Uh, so it has a one-to-one -one overlap with the P with a spin one system, but if you go to spin two, then you have the D wave get, has overlap with T two and E. So there you have to be more careful. So things get a little hairy, but it's just a little bit of uh, bootkeeping in a sense. Um, so it has to have the good quantum numbers with respect to the finite volume Hamiltonian. And so if you have good isospin, so for example, most calculations are performed with up and down quark degenerate. So isospin is, is always a good quantum number. Uh, so you have that much. And then um, if you have, if the system is a rest, you have parity. And then if the system is a rest, you have a cubic symmetry. So then you have to construct operator that, that are, uh, that are irreps of the cubic group. Is there any way to make uh, this uh, converge faster by choosing appropriate operators? Those are, yeah, so that's, that's, those are the op appropriate operators. Otherwise, what you would get, this identity, for example, you would have an identity that you, in order to have, what you would have here is a sum over all possible irreps that have overlap with this operator. Mm -hmm. So if you constructed an operator that just has infinite volume symmetry, then you would have an infinite sum of all possible cubic, oh, not an infinite sum, it would be a finite sum of all possible cubic reps that have overlap with uh, that infinite volume uh, orbital angular momentum state. So more than that, you can make the operators bigger so they have a better overlap with these states. With oh, yeah. That happens, you can make the excited states less important. Yeah, you, you have a lot of freedom in how, you, yeah. There's many different types of operators that have the same quantum number in the infinite volume. You can smear, uh, you can have point, point. So there's many different operators that you can construct that have the same. So you have a lot of freedom. And actually, that's, that's how these people, which, so here's a hadron spectroscopy collaboration and that is mainly at Jefferson Lab. This is how they've been able to disentangle this big spectrum. It's constructing a wide range of operators that have the same quantum numbers. So here is a tower of states. Uh, that are identified by their JPC quantum numbers, and I see that you can't very you can't see it very well, but this is zero minus plus uh, one plus minus. I think I can't see it even there. Minus no, minus. one minus minus. Sorry, yeah, uh, and so on. So these are you know each one of these it, it represent the state that you extract from the from a lattice from a lattice calculation, and these are performed at approximately 400 MeV pi masses. And they're at a single volume. Uh, so, so this, the, 
OK, so I've answered my own question. <laughs> so the Masonic sector is much easier. The baryonic sector is, is extremely hard. There's a, a signal to noise problem that we discussed uh, earlier in this week in Monte Carlo calculations. So it also permeates. It also, it also appears in, the, in lattice QCD for the nuclear sector. So if you even, I mean, the hope of having this much uh, resolution for the spectrum in the nuclear sector is, is far uh, down the line. Uh, so this is why the Masonic sector is so uh, powerful. But the question that I'm after is, how do you interpret the spectrum? You know, in principle, you would look at this and you would say, aha, there's some energy level at this, uh, at this energy. And that tells me that there, if I want to think of, you know, the way that we've thought about things thus far is that this looks like possibly a resonance in the infinite volume with that given energy. Uh, and that is nice, you know, that gives you a nice fuzzy feeling, but the story ends up being a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, and what we do know is that this finite volume spectrum actually can be mapped onto infinite volume scattering parameters. And what I want to tell you is uh, give you a little bit of a uh, taste of how we actually know this. Um, before I do that, there's a, a wide range of, there's, been, there's a long list of, uh, system of papers that have studied uh, strongly interacting systems in a finite volume. And there's also been a lot on the weakly interacting systems, but I'm solely going to be talking about strongly interacting systems for today. Uh, and I, what I just wanted to point out is that there's uh, quite a bit of uh, UW representation. Uh, and I would say that it's fair to say that the first uh, study that non that, that treated non-perturbative systems in a finite volume was by Lucher, hence why this formalism is typically referred to as Lucher formalism, even though there was previous studies that were uh, that studied non-perturbative physics. Um, okay, so just to give you a little bit of taste on how we actually know this mapping between the finite volume spectrum and the infinite volume scattering phase shift holds. I thought we'd look at a, a simple one-dimensional problem. So this is, a, this is L. This is my box. Uh, I impose some periodic boundary conditions. So I just write it in a circle. I just draw a circle. And this is my wave function for the state. Uh, with asymptotic, well, the, it's just a plane wave. If I impose periodic con boundary conditions, it just means that at L, the wave function has to be equal to that value at the origin. And that puts a constraint on the momenta that are allowed. And that's exactly what you expect. So N here is just some integer. If I then put two particles in my box, and I set X to be the separation between these two, and P to be the relative momenta, then the wave function uh, is, again, a plane wave with a phase that has been shifted by two delta. Uh, and this is the infinite volume phase shift of the system, which is a function of momentum. If I again impose periodic bond conditions, so I get that I require that the wave function is equal at L as it is at the origin, I get this condition for the, for the spectrum. So this is a self-consistent equation that the momenta should, be, should satisfy. So this is a function of momenta, this is the momentum. And then n is just some integer that goes from 0 to infinity. So just to give you a little taste on uh, what we actually do in a lattice calculation, this is, again, the, that equation, the quantization condition. And I've cooked up some, some phase shift that is just a simple polynomial of the momentum. And I input it through this equation. And I set n equals 0. And this is what I got for p. If I set n equals 1, this is what I get for p n equals 2, 3, and so on. And this is the momenta as a function of volume. And this is the phase shift as a function of energy, of momentum. And, but what we actually do on our lattice calculation is you set the volume to some number, you extract some, you construct some set of operators that gives you so, some determination of the spectrum, and you extract some spectrum, uh, some, ener some energy level. I then put that energy level through this function, I set n equals 0. And that gives me a constraint on the phase shift at that energy level. So that tells me, this equation tells me that the momentum, that the phase shift at the momentum being equal to 0, when I set n equals to 0 here, I get that the phase shift is 0. If I then extract this energy level, I put it through this equation, I then get the phase shift at that energy. 
If I just dial the volume, then I get another determination for the phase shift, and so on. So slowly, by determining the spectrum, I begin to constrain the infinite volume phase shift. And so what you end up looking, uh, uh, determining looks kind of like experiment. You end up getting a bunch of data points of, and then I say data points, but you end up getting a, a, a bunch of uh, determinations of the phase shifts with some error bars, and then you can then proceed to fit, fit that to be able to get some uh, determination of the phase shift. So that's the one plus that's the one plus one dimensional system. Now I'll tell you. Oh, sorry. I'll give you a sketch on how you can generalize this formalism for three plus one systems with uh, arbitrary quantum numbers. So again, what we're after is the correlation function. And so by looking at the poles of the Fourier transform of this object, that gives me a constraint of the full correlation function. Uh, that gives me a constraint of, this, of the spectrum uh, in a finite volume. So uh, what I want to do is Fourier transform this object and then uh, evaluate it diagrammatically and look at the poles of the correlation function. So the Fourier transform of this, of this is equal to this. So it depends on the total momentum and the relative momenta. And here what I have is some, uh, let's, okay, so I create a two particle state. I let it propagate and I annihilate it some later time. Uh, both of the particles have to carry discretized momenta. So I divide it as K and the other one carries P minus K. And these propagators are uh, fully dressed propagators, so they include every single possible uh, um, diagram. So it includes, it's just a geometric series of one PI diagram, so it includes all possible bubbles. Uh, I can then insert a single uh, kernel, uh, so I can insert a and I should say, this is a, a, so this is an extension. What, I, what I'm doing here is an extension of work that Steve uh, Sharp did with his collaborators in 2005. Uh, the only difference is that now we can also include spin as well as, as, well as inelasticities. So, um, so here, what, I, what I've included is a, is a beta sub Peter kernel, which is, so I've one possible uh, interactions between the incoming and final states, and this includes all possible two-particle irreducible S-channel diagrams. So you can have a contact interaction, you can have T-channel diagrams, U, you can have T-channel diagrams with some other intermediate set of particles, so you can have pi in exchange and so on, if it's allowed by the symmetries of your system. And this kernel is related to the fully dress, the full uh, infinite volume scattering amplitude in this self-consistent equation. This, the scattering amplitude is really just a sum of all possible diagrams. And then you keep on uh, introducing higher, uh, higher, um, uh, higher order of diagrams. And here I have to start thinking about loops, finite volume loops. And what you can show, as I said, uh, uh, what Kim Sakrata and Sharp showed is that the difference between this finite volume loop and its infinite volume counterpart uh, can be, depends solely on a, fu on a function that depends on the on-shell uh, the on-shell states of these intermediate particles. And it is because the on-shell states, so the, the on-shell uh, two-particle states, can then propagate and sample the boundaries of your volume. This is why you would expect there to be a, a large volume correction associated with these states. So this, you know that the difference between these two should be some quantity, and it turns out that that quantity only depends on the uh, on-shell states. And so these kernels, I can then evaluate it on shell, and in, and in between them, I have some function that depends on the on shell momentum. And so what I've done is represented these kernels in a matrix representation. So they're matrices that depend on the total angular momentum, as well as the orbital angular momentum and the spin of the system. And this delta G is just an infinitely large matrix that couples uh, incoming set of quantum numbers to outgoing set of quantum numbers. So it just becomes a little complicated, but you can just compactly write it in a matrix representation. And then you can also include uh, uh, inelasticities. So for example, if I had a two pi and state coming in, I can also include a two k and state intermediate, and so on. And really, if you upgrade everything to a matrix, uh, so I upgrade the kernels into a matrix over the channels, and then the, the intermediate propagator into a matrix 
over the, a diagonal matrix and all the possible channels. This becomes rather straightforward. And then finally, I just resum these diagrams and I replace the infinite volume. So I sum up all possible infinite volume loops into these circles. So this is an infinite volume scattering amplitude. And then I have the remainder of these finite volume loops here. And this ends up looking like a geometric series up to some constant. And what you show is that this, what you can show is that the only possible poles of interest of this correlation function have this behavior. Above this is some, some finite function. Well, it's not a finite function, but it has poles which ca exactly cancel the, the poles appearing here. So at the end of the day, all I care about is this matrix and it's uh, when in, the, in the locations where it diverges. And that leads to this master equation. So what you find is a determinant condition for the inverse, inverse scattering amplitude plus this finite volume function that I described earlier. And so what you find is, is exactly a one-to-one -one mapping between the finite volume spectrum and infinite volume scattering uh, phase shifts or scattering amplitudes. I have all two to two inelastic processes. The limitation is we don't know how to handle, we only know how to handle three particle systems in some uh, limits. So the two body is, uh, we can handle, and we know how to handle relativity, spins, so on. So really we know how to handle everything in the two body sector. Uh, as, as long as, yeah, we don't, uh, so we have to be at energies below three particle thresholds, three or four. So this is a determinant over a set of infinitely large matrices over, or, or uh, in angular momentum space, as well as open two body channels. This object, as I've said, is a scattering amplitude that can couple any number of channels. If I look at some specific example, for example, the positive parity isosinglet to nucleon channel, this is a, uh, one, of, one of the channels. So this would be, uh, which, which would have overlap with the deuteron. This matrix will look something like this. So you have the J equals one, uh, two by two matrix that couples uh, S to D. And then you also have the J equals three D wave and so on. But these wouldn't couple since they don't couple in the infinite volume. This object though is a finite volume object. So in general, it can couple any partial wave. Uh, well, in, in, yeah, in general, it could uh, couple any partial wave depending on the symmetry of your system. It's typically sparse. So some of these matrix elements uh, vanish, uh, but in general, you have to check that. Uh, if I consider a simple case where I say all my partial waves of these two matrices are equal to zero except the S wave, and I just uh, request that the system is at rest, this equation simplifies quite a bit. So I get K cotangent delta is equal to this uh, Riemann zeta function with, depends on, the, on the, uh, the momentum that I'm evaluating. So then I have a self-consistent equation that the spectrum should satisfy, and it depends on the phase shifts. So what you, so the story is, you grab this equation, you put in the finite volume spectrum, and what you extract out is the phase shift. So this is uh, an example uh, of this formalism being implemented by, again, by the Hatspec collaboration, again, at nearly 400 MeV pi masses. And they've, they've performed, they've evaluated the finite volume spectrum, input it through this equation, and they, they get the J equals one, I equals one, pi pi phase shift. And so they get all these different little points that you're seeing. So like I said, it ends up looking like data. And then they fit that and they extract the, the P wave I equals one phase shift. And you see that even at unphysical pi masses, you end up getting a resonance, which as you take the pi mass to be physical, this is a row resonance. And so this is a program on how you can actually study spectroscopy of ex uh, exotic states. So just to say, repeat what I already said, the formalism that we, the, we've been able to drive is, is model independent, non perturbative it's universal. So it doesn't really care if you know, we're thinking about nuclear physics, atomic physics, and so on. It's just a quantum mechanical result 
that just maps a finite volume spectrum to infinite volume physics. So if you want to do uh, think about atomic physics system, so atomic systems in a finite volume, you can implement this formalism if you wish. Uh, and it holds for arbitrary quantum numbers and also for uh, any set of uh, boundary conditions that may be periodic, antiperiodic, or twisted in general. And it could hold for any volume that is a rectangular prism. Uh, and I, should, I just wanted to point out that this was actually partly inspired by a homework, homework assignment by Martin Savage in 2008. So, yeah. He said jokingly that if you solve it, you can publish it. So I did that only four years later. Oh, no, six years later. <laughs> That's depressing. Okay. <laughs> you change your brain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, he said two particles and three particles will spin. So I shouldn't, uh, I haven't even finished the homework. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to say that, uh, you know, it, it checks out it, it, the result that I, that I recently had have uh, agrees with everything that has been done in the literature. And what is nice is that what I derived was a result that was for arbitrary spins, arbitrary number of channels. And then uh, Lee, Lee, and Liu uh, publish a paper two weeks later where they study uh, multi-channel two baryon systems using Dirac fermions. I didn't, I didn't make any assumptions of what kind of, you know, I didn't think about Dirac structure or anything like that. And they did a nice independent derivation and uh, their result agrees with mine in that limit. And the limit where I'm thinking about spin one half particles. So it's nice. Um, so, and what I wanted to give you in the last couple of minutes is a taste of this, uh, the, you know, predictions of, from this formalism uh, to what we should be expecting to see in nuclear physics. Uh, and this comes from an earlier work uh, with Soria Davoudi, Tom Lu, and Martin Savage, where we decided to just put in, that, uh, put in um, physical phase shifts into the quantization condition and then predict what the spectrum will look like in, uh, in a finite volume and see what kind of lessons we can learn. So this is the, the T1 spectrum. This is a uh, cubic irrep in the center of mass that has overlap with, the, with j equals 1, also with j equals 3. Uh, d here is the boost vector. So this is, you can think of as a momentum divided by 2 pi over L. And so the momentum is, is 0. And like I said, I've set the, masses, the mass of the pi to be physical. And this is a non-relativistic energy that I'm plotting as a function of uh, volume. And this is what we expect the spectrum to look like. So this little line down here is a deuteron. So you see the non-relativistic energy is, is negative. So you see that it, it slowly goes up and it asymptotes to the dashed line, which is the physical value of the deuteron energy. Um, and this, the blue states are states that ha uh, have strong overlap with S wave. The red states are states that have uh, strong overlap with D wave. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this line is a T-channel cut. Just to point it out, uh, so the effective range expansion breaks down, but the formalism holds up up to uh, pion production. So a little closer look. Um, so just to remind you, the J equals one uh, scattering amplitude is a two by two matrix. The off diagonal uh, size of the off diagonal terms of the scattering amplitude are proportional to sine epsilon, which is the mixing angle. And uh, the mixing angle is a very small quantity at the physical point. So this is uh, in degrees. And so this is approximately one degree at about 60 MeV. So Q is the relative momenta. So it's a, it's a tiny phase, it's a, yeah, it's a tiny angle. And so what we decided to look at is turn on and off the, the mixing angle and see how the spectrum changes. So what I'm plotting here is the excited states, the first, second, third, and fourth. Uh, and what, I've, uh, what we've evaluated is the spectrum with epsilon being on and epsilon being off. And just look at the differences. So this is a S wave, the first excited state, and this is a D wave, D wave, S wave, and so on. And what you find is that the spectrum, the difference between epsilon being on and off is at the KEV level, which if you're seen any lattice calculation, that's the level of precision that we'll probably never get. Uh, so it's a little bit depressing because this mixing angle is associated with the tensor force. So, you know, it would tell us that by looking at the spectrum at rest, we cannot extract the, the tensor force. 
And then we also looked, so there's a little close-up of what we expect the, the, the deuteron to look like. So this is again the, the deuteron asymptoting to its infinite volume uh, limit. And again, I look, we looked at the difference between when the epsilon is on and off, and what we find is that it's practically, uh, that difference is practically zero. So the, the deuteron in a finite volume is, uh, is, a, a, is mostly S-wave. And so then we decided to look at a booster system. So we decided to boost the, the deuteron in the Z axis. And uh, so here, let me show you first what you get if you set the D wave phase shifts, all the D wave phase shifts, and epsilon to zero. So here's just a simple S wave uh, energy level. And this is what you get. And this was predicted by two different groups. If you then uh, include uh, D wave and, and epsilon, you get that there are two different energy levels. One, which is the A2 irrep, which basically you can think of as a deuteron having zero helicity. So I'm boosting it along the z-axis and I just give it zero helicity. And the E irrep is a two-dimensional irrep, uh, which is basically uh, a, a symmetric and anti-symmetric linear combination of the deuteron having positive helicity and negative helicity. Uh, and what you see is that these two split in a finite volume, but they both asymptote to the physical uh, deuteron energy. But these are uh, large volumes for lattice QC standards. So if you're doing some uh, uh, real, I mean, like a large computation uh, calculation of nuclear physics, you might want to look at uh, Fermi boxes that are up here, but lattice QC calculations, I mean, this is. Uh, larger than any calculation that has been done to this day. So we're really in this regime. And so what we decided to look at is look at the A, for example, look at this, uh, this energy level. This is the full A2. We decided to then dial on and off different parameters. And here we set the D wave phase shifts equal to zero. And what we find is this little bump. If you then set epsilon to zero, but the, you keep the, the D wave phase shifts, this goes from this energy level down to this energy level. And so it, it gets really close to what was just the S wave uh, deuteron. Same thing here. So if you have the E rep, we turn off the D wave phase shifts, we bump up to here. If we then turn up e epsilon, but keep the D wave phase shifts, we go down to here. And so that tells us that this gap between these two energy levels is mostly epsilon. It's mostly due to epsilon, and it's also due to a sign of epsilon. So if we switch epsilon, these two guys would switch order. And that's a, a remarkable, uh, well, I think it's a remarkable observation because epsilon is a tiny quantity. So if you look at the, the momenta of interest, uh, we're you know, somewhere around here. So the, the kappa is, in, you know, is 45 at the, at the bound state. So we're around 45 and 50. At that, uh, for those energies, the epsilon is in the order of two to three, in negative two or three degrees. So there is a tiny quantity having a order one effect in the spectrum. So there is a one MeV gap in a two MeV bound state. What is the meaning of kappa? Kappa is equal to, so I've set K, so the uh, momentum is equal to I kappa. So that's a binding momentum. So the take home message is, that making an, uh, an approximation that is suitable for infinite volume physics might just lead to an order one of, uh, error in a finite volume. And so we really have to, if we want to think about non-perturbative systems in a finite volume, we really have to do non-perturbative uh, analytical derivations of the mapping between the finite volume spectrum and infinite volume physics. And then we proceeded, oh, I took a slide out, but that would be, that's fine. So we, we did a, a, a study of an estimate of how well you can extract epsilon as well as the binding energy uh, at really low volumes. And you can do a really good job by thinking about different boosts. Uh, and yeah, I won't have time to show that. I'll just skip ahead. Well, I just have a question. So I guess from old nuclear physics, you know that the neutron has a small D wave component. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's, so when you put in, so we don't have the advantage of turning on and off anything. We'll just put in quark masses and then nuclear physics comes out. 
So you know what we wh what I'm saying is that when you do the lattice calculation, assuming the yeah, assuming that the phase shifts that we use are correct and everything works out, what you would get is two different energy levels at this volume, and that's it. And then we have to have some interpretation of those energy levels. So if we would have assumed that the D wave component, so the epsilon, the, the mixing angle, was zero in analyzing the spectrum, we would have gotten a wrong mapping to the infinite volume spectrum, or the, the infinite volume physics. And what we're saying is that really you need to keep track of everything and you have to, using the non-perturbative uh, derivation of this formalism, you have to test that quantities really vanish in, and that they, they lead to a small effect. In general, there could be a large effect. So you need to be really careful. And so what I want to leave you with is a, a little bit of a qualitative story of where things stand. So um, it, I think it's fair to say that if we I do the, the two-dimensional analog of FMOF, the FMOF plot, it's fair to say that at this point we, we know the two-body sector uh, extremely well. We can do, we, can, we know, uh, we know how to deal with bound states with and without spin. We know how to deal with uh, uh, scattering states, whether they're repulsive or attractive, with arbitrary magnitudes of their interactions. And we know how to deal with inelasticities and so on, with any number of inelasticities as, well, as long as they're, uh, they're two body. In the three body sector, um, thus far, everything that has been done is regarding spinless identical particles. So, uh, what we're starting to do is is map out how can we study the three-body sector um, uh, using finite volume physics. And what I would argue is that there are, the, well, not argue, but I, I think it's, it's fair to assess that there have been two classes of studies so far. Uh, one that was uh, done by Soria Davoudi and I, where we looked at the, uh, the three-body problem and decided to just simply dial the interaction to be strongly interactive uh, and slowly, slowly att uh, strongly attractive, sorry, and where you, f you, uh, you get a two-body bound state and found that the three-body problem ends up looking quite a bit like a two-body problem with uh, corrections that are dictated by the size of the two-body uh, two system compared to the volume. Uh, and as you take the, the energy to be, so as you take the bound state to be, uh, nearly unbound, these vo volume effects get rather large. There's also been uh, uh, really exciting, promising work by uh, Steve Sharp and Max Hansen, and as well as uh, collaborators out in Germany. So these are two different groups, uh, <laughs> I should say. This is uh, older work in the, where they, uh, Polyeva and Akaki Rusetsky looked at non-relativistic spinless systems, and now Max Hansen and Steve Sharp are looking at non-relativistic uh, non spinless uh, systems. Relativistic. relativistic, sorry, relativistic spinless systems, uh, uh, and what they've been able to show is that their non-perturbative formalism holds at least for uh, um, repulsive systems. Is that fair to say? Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, and they're still what we're still trying to connect is how can we start mapping out uh, the rest of the spectrum. Uh, uh, using a model independent, strongly interactive, and be able to connect the bound states as well as scattering states. Uh, and it's, prom it's, it's, it's shown to be really challenging. So there's still quite a bit of work to be done in the three body sector. And also, once we understand spinless systems, we need to move on to spin full systems as well as non identical particles. And finally, I want to go back to this. Uh, um, the sets of systems that we that I introduced earlier in the in the t in the talk, and um, I decided to um, give a little taste of where things uh, sta stand. And this is my personal very biased uh, estimate of where things stand. So if you object to this, please yell at me, uh, and I'll gladly change it. Uh, but there's so what I've decided to do is include a box that describes the status of formalism as well as systematics uh, understanding of systematic and so on. And a little circle that uh, tells us where the code development of these calculations stands and if there's been any lattice QC calculation on them. So I put in a box and a circle next to everything. Uh, and first I will give what I think are, uh, well, 
So here, I identify a check mark for things being completely under control uh, and uh, exclamation mark where there's been exciting progress but much more to be done and a question mark to basically suggest that it's a really an open problem and a lot more work needs to be done. So let's first look at the check marks. Uh, I think it would be hard to argue that the two bodies, uh, or argue against the fact that it's fair to say that the two body system is well under control. We know how to uh, study uh, elastic as well as inelastic two body systems. Uh, there's been quite a bit of calculations that just need to implement the formalism and be able to study inelasticities, inelasticities in, in the two body sector. We know how to deal with balance states and uh, things involving, you know, K to pi pi has been done at the physical point. It's been a uh, remarkable success. So these are things that really are under control uh, and what things that uh, still, there's quite a bit of work to be done is regarding uh, more than two body physics, so three body sector. Uh, also, uh, although these kinds of calculations look remarkably similar to the K to pi pi, uh, we still don't know how to deal with uh, processes involving external currents that in inject momentum into the system, uh, for momentum into the system. So there's been some, some calculations, but much more work has to be done. And then things involving matrix elements of uh, two nuclear or more is really still an open problem. We've done a little bit of work in this direction, but it's, it's turned out to be quite a bit more challenging. Um, so, so why in the second line is the question mark on the left side of the, the right, in the uh, code development side? Uh, show me, well, the second line here? Yeah. Why is there? It's just that one's been done a little bit. Than the other. There's been. I, I think there's. I mean, there's certainly been work on this. I don't think there's any been any work on this. Matter of who's done some work. Right. So I mean, I think this is actually easier right. than this. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is that so here, t what has been done, and Wayne might be more familiar with this, is you uh, people have looked at. Uh, a nucleon operator in introducing some external current and then some delta-like operator. But the delta hasn't been treated as a resonance yet. And so this would be easier, but I don't think there's been even a uh, 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 pi on to rho, for example. Um, so yeah, so with that, uh, I will leave you with this and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, 0.3, I don't think this has gone that far. I think, it, I mean, 0.5 is probably the small, 0.6, it's 0.6. 0.06, sorry, 0.06, sorry. Oh, 0 .06. Yeah, so 0 .06, oh, okay. yeah. yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, can you can you why say that? Why do you care so much about the FMR states? I think maybe the, the thing to look at would be the three team or hidden three, right? When you put the instant. So n I, n we don't. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not suggesting that I particularly care about FML states. I'm saying we have to have a, f a formalism that is suitable for any sorts of system that comes out of the lattice. We don't get to choose what comes out. So I need we need to have a model independent general result that holds for either weakly or strongly interactive systems with spin or no spin. Because we don't, we, I mean, we could look at a spin system, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the, the sets of interactions and the binding energy that comes out, we don't get to choose that. We don't even know a priori what they would look like at on physical pi masses. So um, we just need to, our job on the formal side, on the analytical side is to just have a tool that is useful for any set of calculations that comes out. Uh, of course, spin would be interesting. You know, having a, a three-body spin result uh, would be interesting, but it, it, it turns out that introducing spin only complicates the story more, and the technical issues are 
for the most part, can be addressed by just thinking about uh, uh, just spinless systems. So I would think that you know it's going to take us a while to have. A, well, no, it might not take us a while, but it, it, it it's taken a while to get a full non perturbative three-body result for scalar uh, identical particles. Once that's there, I think it's going to be a rapid transition to having a result with spinful non-identical particles. The issue is just having three particles. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand how do the pion masses enter into this? Um, so, you difficult to calculate a typical pion mass. So, there's a, a, a nice story by Lepage that says that if you look at the, the, the variance of, so you have some correlation function, which is a nuclear, uh, you create a nuclear and you annihilate a nuclear. If you look at the variance of that, it, it would be, uh, n so you would have a nuclear squared and an anti nuclear squared. And you can arrange those things in such a way that you can show that the, the ground state of the variance is a uh, is three pions. And so you can think that you know you're creating some some quark out of the vacuum, but it, you know you you have some quark propagator, but really you can end up creating quark anti quark pairs in the vacuum, and then and so the pion mass comes in in such a way that it, it leads to a, a larger noise for the nucleons than in the than for the mesons. And yeah, it ends up being, I'm trying to think, so the signal, so the signal to noise ratio ends up, if you look at the variance, you can estimate it to be uh, e to the minus n minus 3 halves n pi t. And then there's also some square root of the number of gauge configurations and the volume comes in. Um, but this just comes from, uh, so you can think of the variance. So if I look at, I can arrange, so if I look at, so for example, something like n dagger, then I have n dagger, n. I can arrange things in such a way that uh, you know I have three quarks and three antiquarks in, in the variance, and I can arrange things so that I have uh, end up having three pions being emitted. Uh, so it's a qualitative story as to why it's true. Uh, I think having a, like a complete rigor story as to um, that's something that you can ask David Kaplan, but I think it's still not quite understood because he's been thinking a lot about the the signal to noise problem, I'm not as QC. But. Sort of naively, I would think that there should be some optimal lattice size, right? In the sense that, I mean, on the one hand, I want a really big lattice mm -hmm. because I want to get rid of finite volume effects. But on the other hand, if I make my lattice bigger, then um, all my states become a lot denser, and yeah. so I need a lot more accuracy. That's right. So Um, no, so the, the perfect lattice is <laughs> multiple lattices <laughs> that satisfy, so what dictates uh, the volume, do you want the volume to be large compared to the, the inverse of the pion mass? Because that dictates, uh, there's large corrections due to the fact that you're interacting with your mirror images. So you need n pi L to be large, so typically 4 is something that people feel comfortable with. Uh, and then after that, you run into the problem that if you have an ungodly large volume, then you know, things get, uh, you know, the energy levels do get too compact. And, but luckily, most calculations are not ungodly large. <laughs> so what you really need is you know, multiple volumes. Typically, so for example, the Hatzpeck collaboration does uh, calculations at, and also MPOQC and other co collaborations typically do at three different volumes, starting at n pi L4, roughly. And then n pi of like 4.3 and so on. And then as many volumes as you can get gives you more information. Because this, this, this uh, 
formalism, for instance, gives you insight into, you know, for different volumes, you have different energy levels, so you have different constraints on the phase shifts, for example. So the more volumes, the better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the question I bring up from time to time, when I see sort of these KEV shifts that you need for certain properties, um, is if you put an external probe in the lattice QCD calculation, one that you have theoretical control over, that could a theoretical probe, let's say you turn on QED and you vary the alpha coupling or you put in a background field or something like that, mm -hmm. um, lead so that you, when you actually measure on the lattice, you have a larger separation. You can actually measure, get a better, better non-zero signal, but then you have a theoretically controlled extrapolation that you can extrapolate to the physical value. No sense, uh, having the big, big yeah, so that's one example. Exactly but I'm saying if there's other things right. like that. Like how... Uh, Maybe I haven't thought about that. I mean, it, that that to me seems costly, right? Because I mean, whatever you do, oh, you have this. It's costly, but I mean, it's probably going to be more feasible than getting KEV resolutions in boxes. Yeah, but okay. I think I mean, the most expensive thing volume. overall is always the volume. The volume is almost always the most expensive thing. Right. The larger volume is always the hardest. Thing. But I mean, I, I'm uh, so let me go back to this plot because I'm confused. So here. You're you're worried about these KV resolution. I mean, if I wanted to extract something on the lattice, that was that was relevant for epsilon one. Uh huh. Um, I'm saying if you put in a background field, you put in some dynamical physics that leads this shift around to being a KV. It's an MEV. Granted, it's unphysical, but you have a but you have an extrapolation if you know the formula and you know. Yeah. The I mean, if if you can, if we think of like a particular example of something that, you know, where that's needed and we know how to do it, then might as well generate the gauge configurations and try it out, right? And if there's need for that. I just think theoretically, once you, if you know what, what, for, for example, what example the external probe could separate them, you need to think about that first before just running yeah. the calculations. But. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. In this case, though, I mean, we got lucky, I guess, because we, you know, we realized that if you just boost the system, then this KAV gap becomes an MEV gap. And now we're talking about but something so that... So, 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 so you did succeed. Yeah, so this we you know we we found some some probe essentially so by just boosting the system and exploring. Right, that was it, that was yeah, so. Twisting. Yeah, twisting is also advantageous and stuff. So. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, this volume of the lattice is a very useful resource. You can use the volume dependence of the uh, spectrum to determine the phase shift, etc. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, the Find that the lattice spacing is also useful. I mean, whether you can extract some useful ultraviolet physics by looking at smaller and smaller lattice spacing. Hmm. Or if yeah, you the because you have asymptotic freedom? Yeah, so I mean, I would. Can, uh, I don't know if I can think of an example, but it, it might be. The case, can you guys think of anything? Um, I mean, typically you want the lattice spacing to be small, so there are no discretization effects, right? So you would be fighting that limit of wanting to have things to be small, but if you find some quantity that has strong lattice spacing dependence, uh, and you want to extract that lattice, then you would have to have that. But I really don't know if I can think. perturbation theory for the finite lattice spacing, mm -hmm. then you see that certain low energy constants that appear in a sum in the original Lagrangian are disentangled once you turn on the lattice spacing. Mm -hmm. So you can access low energy constants that you couldn't before. Partially introduced by less low energy constants. Right, but it's not clear if you're gaining anything physically, right? Mm -hmm. the, the fact that they only appear in linear combinations in the zero lattice theory tells you maybe you don't care about them separately. Right. But for example, if you want to know the spectrum of the Dirac operator at finite lattice spacing, then you care about them separately. So it's a question of what we would count as physical information. But there is certainly information that people write about. Mm -hmm. How about uh, high energy, with high energy scale uh, physical variables like uh, right. uh, the and the high energy? Right. That I don't know any work about that. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I mean, because of asymptotic. 
freedom and start to imagine mm. what your game means to doing that. Yeah, mm. okay. If there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks, man. Um, how do I turn it?